Fraser John, thank you for joining Spectator TV this week. Fraser, we're back to Tory psychodrama. It's been a couple of weeks. How damaging do you think this latest uh, episode is? Uh, Boris Johnson's decision to step down, not alone, but with two of his backers, therefore meaning free by-elections for Rishi Sunak. Well, I do think that this is quite damaging for Rishi Sunak because his whole promise to the country was that he was the, the bookmark, the era of Tory psychodrama, that chapter had closed and he was going to open a new chapter of, of stability. And this was the point where it was changed. And now when the Conservatives as a party just look like a warring tribal mess yet again. Um, and one of the things you see in your cover story, Katie, is it could get even worse. And of course, we all know that when Rishi Sunak became leader, he was, in his own words, put in rather than won an election. So he knew that he couldn't really, it didn't have much of a personal mandate. He was the loser, not the winner, of the contest with the members. Um, and so he figured he had to keep all of these various um, Tory factions happy. So you could see in his cabinet, this was not a Sunak cabinet, this was what he thought was a truce brokered between various warring Tory tribes. They all got their man in a certain position and that would be fine. Of course, what Boris Johnson wanted was his honours list. So um, all along, Rishi's been sort of waiting and waiting and waiting. And now he said, sorry, Boris, you're not going to get things that you wanted, specifically Nadine Dorries into the House of Lords. Um, at which point um, Boris decides, OK, that's it, it's war. And then we see the sheer power of Tory spite. Now, looking at this, it's, it's pretty weird. You think, what's Boris's agenda? What does he actually want to achieve? Is he trying to get, I don't know, Ben Wallace in as leader or something like that? And the more you ask questions, the more you find out there is no agenda other than simply to weaken Rishi Sunak and to re-establish in the public mind the words conservative and shambles and to make it harder for Sunak to claim that he has been able to move on. Now, I would add to this the financial backdrop of the gilt markets, really quite significant. Um, there was a few weeks when Truss was Prime Minister where we were saying, OK, Liz Truss puts up the gilt rates, look at this, it's 4.3%. The markets are putting up everybody's mortgages. She has to go, she has to go, because the markets say, ah, Rishi Sunak, he'll be the market whisperer. As soon as he comes along, he'll tell the markets everything's going to be fine and they'll calm down. Now, that was the narrative of the end of last year. But now the inflation expectations are going up, the guilt yields are going up. All of a sudden, people think the bank rates are going to peak at 5.75%. The new mortgages, if you're trying to buy a house right now, incredibly expensive. So Sunak has failed on two of his main pledges. One, that he'll calm the markets. Two, that he'll calm the Tories. John, when it comes to, I suppose, how the public look at this, do you think your average voter will tell the difference between Boris Johnson causing problems for Rishi Sunak and general Tory problems. We saw Rishi Sunak this week uh, ultimately hit back at Boris Johnson on Monday when he was speaking at Tech Week. Boris Johnson asked me to do something that I wasn't prepared to do because I didn't think it was right. And if people don't like that, then tough. Has won some praise from his party, but I do wonder how much cut through it has more generally. Well, I think the first thing we have to ask ourselves is how much cut through all of this is having uh, with the wider public. Um, we've not had much opinion polling so far, um, but we've had three opinion polls come out that were conducted wholly or partly since Boris Johnson's resignation was announced on Friday evening, together with that somewhat incendiary resignation statement. And it has to be said that so far, Conservative support has not gone up and it's not gone down. Um, and perhaps we should remember that given the Conservative Party is already at a pretty low point in the opinion polls, there is perhaps a limit to the damage that can be done. Now, I hear a lot of what Fraser says, and clearly the by-elections are unwelcome. Clearly any discontent within the party uh, is unwelcome. But I suspect that so far as the longer-term future of the Conservative Party is concerned, and of Richard Sunak is concerned, it's what's happening to inflation, it's what's happening to interest rates, that is probably the bigger story so far as those prospects are concerned. Because in the end, Mr Sunak, one of the things he's staked his reputation on so far as the public is concerned is um, getting inflation down and by implication there, so also beginning to get uh, uh, interest rates down. Now, while in a sense the economy so far has not done as badly as either the Bank of England or the OBR were anticipating for the early months of this year, um, the inflation numbers are not so good and that could mean in the end 
uh, caused the Conservatives difficulty so far as living standards next year. Um, against that, um, you know, I, I, my, my, my honest feeling about the whole Boris Johnson thing is that Boris Johnson is an outcome focused person. He wants to achieve what he wants to get done. Now, for a long time, that worked fine. So if you prorogue Parliament, um, and even though in the end the courts say that you did what you did was illegal, you don't suffer politically because at least half the country, i.e. those who wanted Brexit to be implemented, were in favour of what he did. Was anybody going to question debatable procure, public procurement policies during the COVID pandemic? No, we all wanted the pandemic to be sorted sooner rather than later. And in the end, the bets on the vaccines worked. But where did Mr Johnson's uh, political fortunes begin to unravel? Well, what was it? It was trying to bend the rules to enable a, a Conservative MP who had been found to have br uh, uh, broken the rules on uh, lobbying uh, to be saved from his punishment. Now, one thing we know, there is no public constituency out there that says we should make life easier for uh, MPs who have second jobs and we're quite happy to see the rules broken in order to do so. And frankly, I don't think there's much of a constituency out there that believes that the rules on the, uh, on, on the, uh, on the delivery of honours should be uh, bent. In other words, the causes belli that Mr Johnson is now pursuing looks to me as fragile as the one with the Owen Patterson affair, let alone uh, the position uh, over, over Partygate. And I, I, so beyond that, I would say at the end of the day, you know, if Mr Sunak is going to have any chance at all of being able to win the next election, one of the things he's going to have to do is to draw pretty substantial clear blue water between both the Johnson administration and the Trust administration. And it may well be that in the longer run, this actually will enable him to do so. Certainly if in the end, when we see the uh, report from the Privileges Committee, and if it's as critical as we anticipate, and the Prime Minister basically indicates that he accepts the judgment of the Privileges Committee, that may well help him in that endeavour. And Fraser, this is an argument we hear from optimists surrounding Rishi Sunak, which is effectively, if you look at what came up as the most frequent complaint during local elections, uh, according to many cancers out on the doorstep and, and others, it was uh, Liz Truss, Boris Johnson, the fallout. And R Rishi Sunak has already differentiated himself from Liz Truss in terms of a different economic approach even though, as you point out, the guilt yields are now back to similar levels. And secondly, he uh, has now, perhaps through the intervention this week, distanced himself from Boris Johnson. So there is a chance this could be uh, a moment where he manages to actually get rid of those ghosts from the past. Well, he certainly is confronting Boris Johnson directly in a way that he hasn't done before. Uh, until this week, he's tended just to not mention his predecessor at all. And now, um, when he was in his speech a few days ago, he was saying, well, I wasn't, basically, I wasn't going to promise um, something I wasn't going to be able to deliver, i.e. Nadine Doris would get a later peerage rather than an immediate one. So he has started to, um, I think he thinks it's safe, and I think he's right to say, but it is safe to... And pick a fight with the remaining Johnsonites because there aren't that many of them. I mean, the ones that are there have basically <laughs> resigned their seats and caused him lots of by-election pain. But as a faction in the political party, they are quite small. So there still is a path to victory for Rishi Sunak, but that's a path which was always narrow and has got a lot more narrow in the last few weeks. Previously, you could see his narrative. It was, well, I came leader when we were 30 points behind Labour. Now it's 15 points behind and if we manage to get this to a 10 points um, deficit by the new year, then the election becomes contestable and who knows what could happen. But for that, he, need, he needed a whole bunch of things to go right. He needed the Rwanda deportation to start happening, the small boats to um, stop um, uh, arriving. He needed inflation to half. By the way, it's still forecast to half, but it's going to be a lot tighter than he originally thought. He needed the Tories to stay um, united uh, behind the belief that he might win if they behave themselves. And he needed the economy to not collapse and at least give him the ability to say that he had economic prowess and that he would stop you know, your mortgage rates going up. All of a sudden, a bunch of these things are looking a lot more questionable. So that narrow path has become even more narrow, still possible. But um, I would say there's about a 20-25% chance of that happening now. 
Now, John, when we look ahead to those free by-elections, two are definite. Nadine Doris is taking her time. She's considering her options. As I say in the cover piece, uh, one minister asked, um, will Nadine Doris just stay in the House of Commons now until she gets that peerage? Almost a threat to Rishi Sunak to play ball. Um, but she may, she may trigger her by-election or at least start the process so it goes near a Tory party conference. But... Working on the assumption we're heading to all three, so uh, Uxbridge, Selby and Mid-Bedfordshire, what do you think the Tories' chances are? Do you think it is a reasonable expectation scenario that they could lose all three? There's a risk that they could lose all three, uh, but there's also a possibility that they could at least hang on uh, to one of them, perhaps not least because of the reluctance of the opposition parties uh, to be able to come to an agreement about how to divide the cake between them. Um, Uxbridge looks by far and away the most difficult to defend. Yes, it's true. Lord Ashcroft did do a poll recently in which he suggested that perhaps Boris Johnson himself might be able to defend the seat. But the honest truth is, you know, this is a constituency that we would expect Labour to win if they were on course in, in a general election uh, uh, to be winning an overall majority. Uh, the swing required is 7.5%. Um, and the current swing in the opinion polls is more of the order of 14%. In other words, he needs little more, uh, Labour lead little more than half the current swing in the national polls. And sometimes, of course, the swing in by-elections is rather greater uh, uh, than in the national polls. So I think Uxbridge is by far away the most difficult. In contrast, both Selby and mid and they're both seats where Labour start off second, but they start off a long second way off. Uh, Selby, the swing required is 18%. In mid-Bedfordshire, it's 19%. So here we need, if Labour are going to win the seat, a bigger swing than the current national polls are pointing to. And that so far is something that Labour have not managed to achieve uh, in this parliament. I mean, even in, uh, in a victory uh, such as Wakefield, we didn't see anything particularly spectacular beyond the current position of the parties in the opinion polls. Um, so that, but that said, I mean, again, I think there's an important distinction between uh, these uh, two constituencies, Selby and Mid-Bedfordshire. Um, Selby does have a record of Labour voting in the past. Now, it, you, it, you, you have to know your onions to spot it, but because uh, Selby was only created as a constituency in 2010. But if we go back to the estimates that were made of what would have happened in the constituency if it had existed in 2005, they suggest that Labour would have only been four points behind in the constituency. And I think therefore, by inference, Tony Blair would probably have won it in 1997 and 2001. So, you know, not a constituency would normally expect Labour to win, but at least there is a recent history of people in the area voting Labour in not inconsiderable numbers. It's also, by the way, a relatively strong pro-Leave seat, about 58% Leave last time. That, you might think, is good news for the Conservatives. No, it's not. It's bad news. Uh, it's very clear from the local elections that now, and we know this also from what's going on in the opinion polls, the Conservatives are losing ground more heavily the more pro-leave uh, a constituency is. Mid-Bedfordshire, it's not certainly not a classic blue wall seat of the kind that we say the Liberal Democrats are focusing on. Voted narrowly for Brexit. Liberal Democrats are third... However, if you again do the, do the, go back all the way back to 2005, this is a constituency where the Liberal Democrats were ahead of Labour in 2005. So Labour, in other words, have never done particularly well in this constituency. So you can see why um, the Liberal Democrats kind of fancy their chances and look as though they're determined to fight the seat hard in a way that I suspect they will not fight Selby. And the $64,000 question is, what will Labour do? Labour are certainly saying, and I'm not surprised about this, that the, those implicit deals that were done over Wakefield and Tiverton, for example, they're not going to be done now because, of course, Labour want now to convince people they can win a general election, they can win big, and kind of standing down for one of your fellow opponent opposition parties doesn't look to be consistent with that message. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the end both of them fight hard, as a result, voters don't necessarily work out which of the two of them is better able to defeat the Conservatives. And although the Conservative vote might go down quite considerably, this perhaps is the one seat that in the end the Conservatives might hang, hang on to. So in other words, Nadine Dorries may find that thanks to the opposition, she at least doesn't do quite so much damage to Rishi Sunak as she intends. 
Finally, Fraser, do you think Nadine will have her revenge? Um, God, do I think Nadine will have her revenge? Well, she's taking it. She's taking her revenge now, certainly. But I think she will milk this for, for quite some time. I'm not sure how many people are going to be swayed by her narrative. As a little girl from Liverpool, all she ever wanted was a place was in the House of Lords, and that was cruelly denied her. Um, but I mean, I, I know it seems to me to be the most indefensibly self-indulgent. I think there. Are, I think MPs should just not have the option of getting bored and resigning halfway through. It's a serious thing standing for Parliament. If you're not prepared to commit to your constituents to serve out the term no matter what, you shouldn't have a goal to stand forward to elections. So she's putting politics in distribute, let alone the Conservative Party. So uh, I think Nadine really is not helping herself. Um, and she, uh, so I think uh, ultimately she will end up with more damage on her reputation than Rishi Sunak will. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you, John. Mm-hmm.